Hallelujah. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And the Word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Please pray for us, most holy Mother of God. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and his cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Be every moment thine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine. We are all yours, Lord Jesus, and all that we have is yours through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. Would you say that after me, beloved? That's what John Paul recommended daily. We are all yours, Lord Jesus. We are all yours, Lord Jesus. And all that we have is yours. And all that we have is yours. Through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, this is a good Protestant church, is that right? <laughs> oh, good. So we're going to pray that we'll read the Bible together. <laughs> This is Psalm 34, and um, it's one of my favorite songs. It's probably one of your favorite if you recognize it. It's so beautiful. It's incredible. One of those things like when I die, I want them to put this, read this psalm for my funeral, this incredible psalm. And would you like to say it after me, beloved, line by line? You know this, right? The word of God on your tongue cleanses you of evil spirits. It cleanses you of sadness, by the way, and imperfections. It is a two-edged sword. It has a power. It has a power. So the Protestants picked up and ran with what we had forgotten. And that's what God does. If we leave aside a gift from heaven, he'll give it to somebody else to use, to make us jealous. That's what he does. And then we get jealous enough, we grab it back, and they come and reunite with us. And that's the plan. Amen. He did the same thing, by the way, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We ignored them and denied them, so he gave them to the Pentecostals, so they took and ran with them. That's what he did. It's our gift, and they have it. Until we get jealous enough, you see, to get them back, then they reunite with us. Amen? 
Isn't that amazing? That's exactly how God works. His gifts will not return to heaven unused. That's from your Bible. It will not return to heaven until the gift is used. So if you don't use it and I don't use it, he'll raise up some Pentecostals to use it. Amen? As we start using them, they all come back, and it's happening now. More than 30,000 Protestant ministers have become Roman Catholic in the last 25 years. More than 30,000. So you, you see that God is at work. The plan is working. Amen? Now here's Psalm 34, God, the Savior of the just, is so beautiful. Beloved, would you say this after me to the beautiful one, the holy one, line by line. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise always on my lips. Now, look what he just said right there. We are not to be complainers or grumblers. His praise cannot always be on your lips if you're complaining. You see what I mean? This is God's will for the Catholic Church. No more complaining. Ooh, baby, I get the anointing on that one from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Even God saying, right on, Father, right on. <laughs> I've had enough complaining from my church, enough. So let's do that one again. That must be important. I, I, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise always on my lips. In the Lord my soul shall make its boast. The humble shall hear and be glad. Glorify the Lord with me. Together, let us praise his name. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. From all my terrors, he set me free. Including COVID-19 and monkeypox. I just added that, you might know. From all my terrors, he set me free. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. I see the Lord smiling, so he's not mad at me yet. Okay. <laughs> the Lord says, he says, that's right, get real, get real, you know? So now the next line, I love this, this, this next line blows my mind. This next line really to me is Eucharistic adoration. And it shows you like at the core of our Catholic faith is a transformation that occurs. Would you listen to this and say this after me? Look towards him and be radiant. Look towards him and be radiant. Let your faces not be abashed. Let your faces not be abashed. This poor man called. This poor man called. The Lord heard him and rescued him from all his distress. And rescued him from all his distress. Now, is that not beautiful? There's almost like a summary of the Christian life right there. But that first line in this stanza, let say that one more time. Look towards him and be radiant. Look towards him and be radiant. You know how Moses was, right? When he would see the Lord, He'd come out, his face was glowing white. They had to put a veil over his face because it would blind the Israelites. It would scare them. Beloved, we have something greater than Moses here. We have the one who made Moses here. Amen? Amen. And if you want to radiate like Moses, spend time in adoration while you still can. I'm prophesying, but I won't get too specific yet. While you still can, beloved, rush to adoration, if you can, seven days a week. You won't regret it. You'll be shining like the sun. And if you feel sad and ashamed, 
crawl to the Adoration Chapel and sit there because by the time you leave, you'll be free and happy. Amen? Amen. That's better than chemotherapy is Eucharistic therapy. Amen? Amen. Amen? Now, look towards him and be radiant. Let your faces not be abashed. Don't walk around with a shameful and sad face. This does not give testimony to Jesus Christ. It doesn't give glory to God. So we have to catch ourselves, even the priests do. Don't walk around with a sad and shameful face. You walk around with joy. So powerful, you almost can't keep your feet from dancing. Amen? It's called happy feet. Happy feet. You want to have that kind of joy, and don't you even leave the chapel until the joy is there. You just tell them, Lord, I'm not going till you fulfill your promise. <laughs> and you be stubborn with the Lord because he likes that. He likes that. Be real with God. Do not leave till the joy breaks through the sadness. Like the sun breaks through the cloudy skies, do not leave till the joy breaks through your heart. Amen? Amen. If you get serious with God, I promise you, he will get serious with you. That is why so many Christians are absolutely dead, because they play games with God. You can't play games with God. When we play games with God, he backs off. But when you're humble and real, he comes closer. Amen? Amen. Now, the next stanza is also beautiful. I'm sure you've heard this. This is one of the benefits of leaving adoration. Do you know what happens when you go to adoration? When you leave, you know who's with you? Let me tell you, would you say this after me? This is the fruit of Eucharistic adoration. Are you ready? Would you say this after me? This is from Psalm 34. The angel of the Lord is encamped. The angel of the Lord is encamped. Around those who revere him. Around those who revere him. To rescue them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is happy who seeks refuge in him. Could somebody put that on my tombstone when I die? <laughs> Just tell them, will you? Now, is that beautiful? That's what happens when you go to adoration. The angels of adoration are there. There's more than a thousand there right now more than a thousand right now. When you leave, you're so beautiful, they follow you home. Because you begin to look like the one they worship. You become like the one you hang with. You know what I mean? If you hang with Christ Jesus, you become like Jesus. And even the angels gasp at your beauty, and they will follow you home. Because you become a living, walking tabernacle. Amen? Beloved, when the victory comes, and it's coming, we may live to see it ourselves when the victory comes, the whole world will be Eucharistic. I am not joking. The whole world will be Eucharistic. Amen? Amen. Every Buddhist, every Hindu, every Muslim, every atheist, and everyone who works for CNN will be Eucharistic. <laughs> Amen? We're going to be in love with God, it's the greatest gift of God to the human race. And take a look at the chapel right now. Would you look back here at the Adoration Chapel? How many people do you see back there? It should be overflowing. Amen? It should be overflowing. See, we, we've lost track of the greatest, the gift of all gifts. Amen? Why don't we say one Hail Mary now? I don't like, ever like to end in sadness. Let us say a Hail Mary to the Virgin of the Eucharist that that chapel will overflow day and night. Can we do that? That everyone in media will wake up and say, whoa, even the Protestant pastors will come running here to worship. Amen? Amen. Let's pray a Hail Mary for that grace to revive Eucharistic adoration, which is the fulfillment of the Bible. The whole Bible is pointing to the Eucharist. Let's pray for that fulfillment. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Now notice that this beautiful stanza about adoration it says, look towards him and be radiant, let your faces not be ashamed. Then it says, the angel of the Lord is encamped around those who revere him, encamped around you. Then it says, you see, adoration leads to communion. Adoration leads to mass. And so it says, next line, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, I find this so humbling about God that even though I'm there worshiping him, giving him glory, he says to me, oh, my little son, that's not enough. I want to unite with you. I'm getting cold seed right now. I don't get it. I love you and I worship you. Why would you be united with this little stinker? <laughs> Why? He says, James, it's not enough. I want to merge with you. This is something more intimate than marriage more intimate than marriage. I want to unite with my people. Is he not the bridegroom? Are we not the bride? He wants to unite with us, God and man mixed together. Is this phenomenal? This is the Eucharistic mystery, amen? amen. And so it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then here's the topper. He is happy who seeks refuge in him. And so if you were to come to me later today, you said, Father, I've been to Mass. <laughs> I'd say, no, you haven't. Because it says clearly in the infallible Word of God, he is happy. And so if you've really united with God, you really adored him, you will leave here dancing to your car. They will call all the sheriff's deputies to come here. They'll say, there is a church full of locos, of cuckoo ones. They're all dancing in the parking lot. And all the deputies will be here because if you've united with God, you will have joy. Amen? Amen. And listen, that's what he said. I've come that you might have joy and have it to the full. Why did Jesus come? That you might have joy. Let me ask you again, why did Jesus come? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now tell the one next to you, to your left and your right, tell them, Jesus came for you to have joy. Tell the one to your left and your right. Wait a minute, this can't be a Catholic church, you're all smiling! This can't be a Catholic, this must be a Protestant church. What's wrong? We're smiling, there must be something wrong. You mean we're not here for a funeral? He came that you might have joy and have it to the full, amen? Now, one little story, and then I'll teach a little bit more. Is that okay, one true story? Because that line, taste and see, that, th that one grabs me every single day. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Mama mia. I was bringing my beautiful mother. She's in heaven now. Her name was Maria. And I was bringing my mother when she was very old to visit her old friend. Her old friend was even older than her. Mrs. Quigley was in her 90s. She was Irish. My mother was Italian. Imagine that, an Italian and an Irish becoming best friends. That's almost a miracle in itself, you know? So I brought my mother. She's in her 80s to see Mrs. Quigley, who's in her 90s. And they had a, a beautiful conversation. I, I brought mom to this place where Mrs. Quigley lived, like an assisted living facility. But I mean, a very nice one, a really nice one. 
And we're in there, and at the end of our conversation, Mrs. Quigley says to my mom and to myself, she says, now, Maria and Father Jim, I want to give you a special gift. And we were, you know, pleasantly surprised. Thank you. She says, come follow me, she said. And she walked to the next room. It was quite a, quite a facility. I mean, she had like a little condominium, basically. So we went to the next room. She pulled out this box. It was a long, like flat white box, maybe two inches high and about two feet by two feet square. And she took the big old lid off of it and it was divided up into little compartments inside, approximately 50 compartments inside. And they all contained first class relics. See, her, she and her husband, her husband was a retired colonel, and um, they were very successful. They, I think, had 12 children, 12 children, but they always supported the church. And every year they would go to Rome and meet with the Holy Father and, and give him a donation, substantial. And not to get anything, they just loved the Pope, John Paul, and they loved the church. They would give him a donation, and he would make sure they received a relic every time. They now had 50 relics, first-class relics. And Mrs. Quigley said to my mother and to myself, now Maria and Father Jim, choose whichever one you want. It was so beautiful. And it was very touching, too, because she was in her 90s, and she knew she was getting ready to fly home to heaven. And you know, when you live in the joy of the Lord, that doesn't scare you, that excites you. When you live in the Lord, the prospect of death is not scary, it's like anticipatory. I can't wait. Why are you waiting so long? You want to fly off, you see? So she wasn't morose, you know what I mean, or, or sorrowful. She's just getting her, her house in order so she can fly with no attachments. And we looked through the relics and my mom chose one. Then it was my turn and I looked and um, believe it or not, there was a, like a, a light, a laser beam light flying out of the box from one relic. I said, well. <laughs> I think I'll take that one. <laughs> it's flying out a, like a laser beam into the sky. So that must be the one. So I go to grab it and I pull it out. It's a bone from St. Camillus who was a Catholic priest, who had a healing ministry, who had been in the armed services. I'm a Catholic priest in the healing ministry, had been in the armed services. And his feast day is on my birthday. Oh, yes. Is God great or is God great? Yes. Amen. Yes. Alleluia. Now, you see that I, I know that he loves me. I'm his, uh, his, like a favorite son, but so are you. And that's my point is, what he did for me, he'll do for you. He is beautiful. He is beautiful. I'm telling you, God is beautiful. I will die for that very word. God is beautiful. And he loves you too. If you make him center of your life, especially through the Eucharist, you make him center, these things will happen to you as well. Amen. Amen. That's the only difference. Make him front and center every day, and you will start seeing miracles this weekend. Amen. Amen. See, it's not me, it's him, right? I love that saying, God doesn't love you because you're good. You're good because he loves you. Amen. Amen. And so, I, I have a wonderful gift, but that's not the miracle I want to share with you. I took the, the, I said, thank you, Mrs. Quigley. I was so very touched by her and by the Holy Spirit. But I looked at the other relics, and there in the upper left-hand corner was a host. I could only assume it was consecrated, and that's against the law, church law. You, you, we can't keep a host in our homes. With it, maybe with the bishop's permission, your bishop could give you permission to have a, a chapel in your house with his direct personal permission. You could do that, yes, that way, properly kept. 
there is a host in one of the 50 squares. And I'm like conflicted and embarrassed and appalled. And I felt just like St. Joseph when he found out that the Holy Virgin Mary was pregnant with child. Because Mrs. Quigley was a saintly woman. She could not possibly have done that on purpose. She was in her 90s, and she was starting to lose a little bit of her memory and her faculties a little bit, you know? And I could only assume she would never do, I mean, I knew this woman my whole life. We grew up, her family and my family. She was one holy Catholic woman, holy woman. She would rather die than desecrate the Eucharist. I could only assume then that what happened was the Eucharistic ministers would come to her house to bring her Holy Communion, that sometimes they're not well-trained, our Eucharistic ministers, and maybe they dropped one on the floor. That happens. And they left, and Miss Quigley was cleaning the house and saw the host and picked it up and put it with the most sacred place she knew was with the relics. She didn't, she didn't know what to do. She put it with the holy relics. That's what I would do too. Actually, it was a good choice. And I bet she forgot about it three minutes later. Forgot. I'm sure, I mean, I know this woman. She would never do that. It's just like Joseph, right? Mary would never do anything wrong. There couldn't be any sin here. I just don't understand it, you see? And so I didn't know what to do, but I do know this. The Catholic priest is the guardian of the Eucharist. And we have to be willing to do anything, even to laying down our lives to protect the Eucharist. And I knew I couldn't leave that host there. I knew I had to take the host and consume it. But if I were to do it in front of my mother, Mrs. Quigley, I would terribly embarrass Mrs. Quigley and scandalize my mother. I didn't want to do that because I knew she didn't do it on purpose. And so I did what any priest would do. I said, look over there. <laughs> and Mrs. Quigley and my mom dutifully obeyed, and they both went. <laughs> they said, where? I said, there. I said, I can't see. I said, that's okay. I said, it's okay. In the meantime, I had consumed the host. And they, they turned back, and nobody was embarrassed. Nobody was hurt. We put the box away. We got in the car. And my mom said, okay, Jimmy, what were you up to? <laughs> you can't fool an Italian mother. Let me tell you right now. You can't fool an Italian mother. So I'm in the car, and mom says, Jimmy, what was up there? So I had to tell her, you know what I mean? And I told Mama, Mama, there was a host. I'm, she didn't do it on purpose, I'm sure. I, and Mama said, oh, you're right, Jimmy. I said, Mama, one more thing. Yes. Mom, that was a consecrated host. Because as I consumed a host, and I'm in the car with Mom, like five minutes later, not only did it taste like human flesh, my mouth began to fill with blood. I said, Mom, that was Jesus. And I couldn't talk because my mouth was filling with blood. And I didn't want to touch my mouth to show her because I had no purificator with me to clean my hands. So I kept driving. And I had to swallow three or four times on the way home. Swallow. Blood till we got home, about a half hour drive. Finally, it cleared. When I got to mom's house, it cleared away. And I felt like Jesus was rewarding me. Do you know what I mean? I'm still a kid, just a little boy. Like, here's son, here's an Oreo for you or a cracker. <laughs> he has to reward me now and then, you know, I'm just a little kid. I felt he was rewarding me that I protected his son, Jesus. So he gave me a special gift, a special experience. Whenever I see that scripture verse now for many years, taste and see that the Lord is good, that's what I remember. 
I tasted and I saw that the Lord is real. Amen? Amen. At every Mass, you receive the same gift, and so do I. At every Mass today at 4.30, the Lord himself, who is the flame of love, will be not only in the host, it actually becomes Jesus. Amen? Amen. Alleluia. And so let's say a Hail Mary of Thanksgiving, that you and I are Catholics and that we know the true teaching of sacred scripture, John chapter 6 in particular, 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 in particular. We know the teaching of the church, of the Lord, of the Bible, that we are privileged in just a few minutes from now to merge and unite with God in the body and blood of his Son. Is this not amazing? Do you see what God has planned for the whole world? Every single, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every Muslim, every atheist, every agnostic will one day receive the Lord with tears, saying, if only I had known before, if only I had known. But thank you, Lord, that I know now. Amen? One Hail Mary in thanksgiving for our faith and in thanksgiving for the Eucharist. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Alleluia. Now remember what my mom said. I'm going to tell you what my mother taught me. If you don't appreciate it, you lose it. So beginning today, pray for the grace to appreciate the Holy Eucharist. Amen? And you want to appreciate with, with like, like Padre Peel would receive Holy Communion. Ask for that grace. I brought his robe again today. Some good friends went to the store for us this afternoon. We had a bright idea and we bought some more handkerchiefs today. So if you didn't get one, we have a few extra today, and we'll, they're there by the altar. We want them blessed by the consecration. That's the greatest blessing, is by the Eucharist. And then after Mass, we'll touch them to the Padre Pio's robe, and you can take these home as well, especially for those who did not receive one yesterday. Amen? Our God is a generous God. Amen? Beloved, I find um, life to be a copious abundance of gifts. A copious abundance of gifts. And I know our Lord wants you to experience your life in this way, that we really should not be like walking in the desert every day. We really should be in a certain sense in the Garden of Eden. He wants your life to be a continuous fulfillment of his generosity is let me love you. And so to go back to this lesson, but to extend it a tiny bit more, we have to place God first in our lives. And one practical application is this. Don't wait for your holy time till 11.30 at night. And don't do it even at 12.30 in the afternoon. But let God have the first hour of the day. I know who you love by who you put first. Amen? Amen? When I put God off till 12 noon or 3 or 11 o'clock at night, I'm saying, you're okay, God. I'll fit you in. That's what we're saying. But if God is God, give him the whole morning. Amen? Amen. Keep that in mind. These practical things are very, very holy, these practical things. Here's a definition of God that I heard once that blew my mind. Can I share it with you? It's like a colloquial definition of God. Now, this might embarrass some of us here today. It might embarrass you. And you might need to go to confession later. But here, I could not believe what I heard. This fellow hit it on the head. He said, who is God? God is the one 
the one person or thing you spend the most time with every day. That's your God. Oh, my gosh. And so I've met many men, for example, who said, Father, I'm a Catholic. They watch 15 hours of football every week, 15 hours, and they come to Mass one hour a week. And I want to say to them that is, he is not your God. Football is your God. I know women in South America, they watch 30 hours of soap operas every week, 30 hours. And they give the Lord 45 minutes on Sunday. I'm sorry, Jesus is not your God. Soap <laughs> opera is your God. And I know some people who love to eat, and they spend three or four hours eating every day, but they only eat the Lord once a week. I'm sorry, Jesus is not your God. Now, isn't that scary? It's sobering, isn't it? I think it's real and important. Who is your love? You know the one you love by the time you spend. If you tell your children, I love you, son, and you give them 30 minutes a month, you don't love your son. You love something else. Oh, thank you. <laughs> if you say to your wife or your husband, I love you, honey, and you give them 15 minutes a week, but you give the television 30 hours a week, I hate to say it, you don't really love your spouse. You love your television. Isn't that terrible? But it's true. Actions speak louder than words. Amen? Amen? I know who you love by whom you spend your time with. Amen? Amen? Don't you dare be fooled. Some of us, ice cream is our God. Don't be fooled. And so this is, I don't say this negatively, this is positive. Make sure you give God the first hour of the day, the first hour, and love him before and beyond and above everything else. Fall in love with God. Amen? Amen? You can't go wrong. He's utterly beautiful. The more he says in the Bible, draw near to me, O man, and I will draw near to you. He's so beautiful. Wait till you get to heaven. The ice cream there is better. <laughs> Amen? So don't worry. All those beautiful things in your life, he made all of them. How beautiful is he who made them? Amen? Amen? So the flame of love, beloved, I want to tell you, the flame of love is it's a flame of happiness. It's a flame of joy, the flame of love. Thomas Aquinas once said in the Summa, uh, just to paraphrase St. Thomas, but he said, in the heart of God, in the highest heaven, is an unending inferno of eternal joy. And so when Jesus says, I've come that you might have joy and have it to the full, what he's saying is, I'm coming from the place of joy, heaven, my Father's house, to earth to bring that joy down here. Amen? So the flame of love is a flame of happiness. It's a flame of joy. And the Lord says that word, while it's very childlike, is very important because joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of God. No one else can give us joy. Amen? But here's an example. I won't, I won't use any names, but it, the Lord says I should use this example. I don't mean this in any sort of political way. It's just real. We've got to be real. Look at the White House. Just look at the White House and all of them who live and work there. I've never seen such a miserable bunch of people in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, confused and miserable because joy does not come from the White House. It doesn't come from Burger King or McDonald's either. It doesn't even come from Walmart. Joy only comes from heaven. Amen? Amen? I remember coming home to this country years ago from Central America for a visit. I had to do some preaching in this country to raise money for the missions. And I was going through, I believe it was the Houston airport, I mean, huge international airport. 
And I, I landed from Belize in Houston, then had to go from my gate to another gate, a domestic flight, you see? And so it was a long walk. I mean, it's a big airport, like more than half an hour to get from my international gate all the way across the airport to my domestic gate. And I just came from Central America where the children and the people are barefoot and some of them even have floors in their houses and they're all beaming and smiling. And when I leave, they say, Father, come back soon. They're smiling and even dancing for me. Come back, come back. And I get to our country, our country. And I'm walking through with my joy from Belize. And I'm smiling at everyone. <laughs> and everyone's like this. <laughs> like they're afraid of me because I'm smiling. I, do you know, I didn't see one smiling face in the whole airport. I, I'm not exaggerating. Not one single American was smiling. Not even one. They thought I was crazy. <laughs> and they're, they're probably half right. No one was smiling. They all had nice clothes on, and they all had shoes and really fancy suitcases and food and Starbucks in their hand, nobody was smiling, not one person. I must have passed, I mean, no exaggeration, at least 10,000 people from where I came all the way through the airport to my gate. It shows you that joy is not an American virtue. It's a heavenly virtue, amen? And so thank God he's given to you this knowledge of the flame of love. If you want to grow in the joy of the flame of, it's a flame of joy. I've discovered that when we read the little book, just like read a page a day, do you know it has a power like similar to the Bible? Not quite the same, but similar. In other words, there is a power in these simple words. It's almost like the Bible reduced to Gerber baby food for you and I. It's like a little baby form of the Bible but it has a power to it to increase your joy. So the flame of love is a flame of happiness, a flame of joy. Amen? Hallelujah. And then the one last important thought I wanted to share with you was this. The flame of love, the bishop said, including Peter Erdo, Cardinal Peter Erdo in Budapest, who approved the, who gave the imprimatur, he said that it's the fulfillment of Fatima. That's the words of the bishops. It's the fulfillment of Fatima is the flame of love. Here is what I want to share with you. Having just come from Ecuador a week and a half ago, Fatima is the fulfillment of Quito, Ecuador, where the nuns are completely incorrupt. And they were told 450 years ago shortly after the year 2000, just when it appears that everything is lost, I will come down from heaven with my son. We will chain Lucifer, we will cast him into hell and convert the human race. Amen? Now she said that categorically at Quito, Ecuador, the only Marian apparition in the history of the Catholic Church that's been approved by every single bishop from the day it happened 400 years to the bishop today. The only one approved by every single bishop. And the present bishop wants to canonize Mariana. And so flame of love is a fulfillment, you might say, of Fatima. Fatima is a fulfillment of Quito, Ecuador. And Quito is a fulfillment of the book of Genesis. Chapter 3, the serpent, the transgender serpent, the abortion serpent, the drug serpent, the Wi-Fi internet serpent, the I'm a pious Catholic but I kill children serpent. The serpent shall lay in wait for your foot, O holy woman, and your woman, your foot, will crush his head. Amen? Is that incredible? Yes. And so I see that, yes, indeed, the flame of love that you and I have, these prayers, 
will bring to fulfillment the promise of Fatima that in the end my heart will triumph even in Pennsylvania. Amen? Amen. And that fulfills Quito. Shortly after the year 2000, when it appears everything is lost, we will come down and save the world. Amen. Amen. And that's a manifestation of Genesis chapter 3. Amen. Amen. It's a clear line. But one more thing you need to know. The flame of love, these prayers, will bring the victory prophesied in Genesis at Quito, at Fatima, now in Hungary. But they're leading to something even greater and higher. They're leading to the divine will. The flame of love is leading us to a place where the entire world will be filled with the highest gift of the Holy Spirit in the history of the church. That's what the Lord says in the writings to Luisa Picaretta. All 36 volumes have an imprimatur from the local bishop and now from the Vatican. From the Vatican. Don't let anybody tell you this is unapproved. Now, when you say it's unapproved, you're actually in sin to say that. It's actually sinful to speak against what the Catholic Church has approved. Amen? Amen. All 36 volumes are approved now by the Vatican herself. And they say that when the victory comes, we all receive a new gift called living in the divine will. The Lord says, from the flame of my love will come my divine will. And so listen, how did we hit the jackpot, you and I? How did we hit, how are we so blessed, you and I? This is why the flame of love is a flame of hope. Amen? Amen. It's a flame of hope. God has plans. And our Lord wants me to share with you, if you spend quiet time in prayer, listening to the silence together, before the Eucharist, the Mighty One will speak to you as well. He will speak to you and tell you the plan. Amen? Amen. Beloved, I want to say to you, all is not lost. We're just getting started. Amen? Amen. I have the Spirit over me all over right now. All is not lost. That's Satan's lie. I have seen him face to face. He is a liar. He has bad breath too, by the way. <laughs> he's ugly and he's a liar. He's a cheater. All is not lost. We're just getting started. And I'm so excited. I better stop now because I'm going to fly through that roof. You see? <laughs> We're just getting started. Amen? Amen? And all of it is there in the Eucharist. It's there in the host, the flame of love, the book of Genesis, the victory of Quito, the promise of Fatima, the divine will. It's all there in the Eucharist. Amen? Amen. Tonight, when you receive the Lord, get ready, because tonight your tongue will burn. Amen? Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Alleluia! Alleluia! Who are the luckiest people in the world? Ain't no doubt. Ain't no doubt. Amen? Amen? Can we give to the Holy One a round of loving applause to the Holy One, to God? Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey!